Thank you. We turn now to topical questions. And our first question is from Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle air pollution in the light of reports that this is responsible for the rise in childhood cancers. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government takes the health impacts of poor air quality very seriously and of course any cancer diagnosis is devastating for a child and their family. The Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy sets out actions to further reduce air pollution across Scotland and an independent review of the strategy is currently underway and will identify priorities for additional action. We provide £2.5 million in annual funding to local authorities to support air quality improvements. And we're, of course, we're also working to deliver low emission zones across Scotland's four biggest cities by 2020, with the first already introduced in Glasgow. Jenny Mara. The problem is that many of the bus companies are going to struggle to, for their fleets to meet the requirements of the low emission zones and I have raised the issue of diesel polluting buses in this chamber many times over the last few months. National Express as an example, the main bus operator in Dundee still has 90 buses, a large proportion of its fleet, which fail to meet the Euro emission standards. Now these buses are belching out fumes and bus operators in their wisdom presiding officer put the oldest most polluting buses on school routes all over Scotland. So they are carrying children who are most vulnerable to air pollution to and from school. Now, I know the SNP have been reluctant to regulate the bus industry in any way, but these reports today must make the Minister very worried. Can the Cabinet Secretary please give me a commitment today in light of these reports about an increase in childhood cancers that she will write immediately to the bus companies and ask them to put clean Euro 6 buses on every school route in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I thank the member for her, uh, uh, her question, although uh, in the main she will be aware that that falls to my colleague who happens to be sitting here uh, um, uh, this afternoon as well. Um, we are disappointed with the uh, low take-up um, by the bus companies uh, of uh, uh, the grants that have been made, uh, been made available to them. Um, I know that uh, uh, um, uh, there have been bus companies that have taken up uh, the grants and uh, it, is, it is disappointing that more haven't, but we do continue to engage directly with them to encourage them to take up available funding to make rapid progress on reducing emissions. And I will certainly undertake to, uh, um, well, it feels a little odd to say undertake to write to my colleague, given that my colleague, the Transport Secretary, is sitting right next to me, um, to, uh, uh, to raise with him directly uh, the issue that is being raised by, by Jenny Mara. Um, uh, uh, it is, you know, in terms of a uh, question about mandating the uh, uh, bus companies to do uh, uh, one thing or another. I mean, obviously, at this stage, what we are trying to do is to get the bus companies on board or, uh, right across the piece in respect of air pollution. Jenny Mara. Signing off, sir. I appreciate that this is a cross-cutting issue across many portfolios, but climate change is. Uh, it's across all the portfolios of government, so I don't think that should be a hindrance to any action. The First Minister has declared a climate emergency in Scotland, so this should become a priority. The, the, the scheme which the, um, which the Cabinet Secretary refers to did have very low take-up, and that is because the Scottish Government was only funding up to 45% of the retrofit cost. And so many of our bus companies across Scotland actually have buses that are so old, Euro 3, that they cannot be retrofitted. And they are telling me they cannot afford to do anything about them. But these are the buses that are on the school routes. So I would repeat to whichever minister or whichever cabinet secretary on the front bench today can take this action to please write to all our bus companies in Scotland and let's get these polluting buses out of the school routes and off of the streets outside our schools. Presiding officer, if I can come on to my second question, private car ownership. Ms Mara, I'm sorry, but uh, that's too long. I'm going to have to move on to the next question. You've had a, a good go and a good statement, so no further okay, questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are three members wish to get in. On... If the member hadn't taken a whole uh, of our second question to make a speech, uh, I would have taken a second question, but I can't. I, no, I'm sorry, I can't allow members to go on too long. It's unfair. There's three members who wish to come in in the back of this. So, 
Uh, Miles Briggs to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With regards to um, the school estate, I wondered what uh, consideration has been given um, by the Scottish Government to air quality monitors across um, our school estate and what works ongoing to look towards actually monitoring um, the problems which have been outlined uh, by Jenny Mara today? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, the, these matters are effectively for local government to take forward, and SEPA uh, already um, provide air quality monitoring units uh, um, uh, in order that they be put in place where local authorities consider them to be appropriate. But um, this is a really a matter for local authority to consider. Not all uh, um, schools may be areas where there are real problems, but I know that there are some, particularly in places like Edinburgh and Glasgow, that are. Um, and I would have anticipated that local authorities would be uh, trying to ensure that they understand uh, the situation around those schools. Uh, and I should say that uh, uh, the introduction of low emission zones will begin to have an impact, as they would have an impact on the issues that were being raised by uh, Jenny Mara, because the introduction of low emission zones begins to force the hand of a number of bus companies in respect of what they're doing. Julian Martin, to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what engagement the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding the use of tax powers that rest with the UK Government that would support industries and businesses to invest in more sustainable transport options that would contribute in the reduction of emissions, particularly in built-up areas? Cabinet Secretary. Um, that is perhaps another aspect of uh, uh, the issue that is raised by, uh, being raised by Jenny Mara. Um, I have written to the UK Government in response to the UK Committee on Climate Change's advice asking it to act immediately in a number of reserved areas, uh, given the CCC were clear that this is critical to Scotland achieving its net zero. And in respect of transport and uh, issues to do with that, um, those issues include redesigning vehicle and tax incentives to support industry and business investment in zero emission and sustainable transport choices, and committing to adhering to future EU emission standards regardless of our position in relation to the EU. Um, so far, the response from the UK government hasn't addressed the points raised in my, in my letter, but they give, a, they give a flavour of the reality of how we're having to handle things, both from a devolved and from a reserved uh, uh, perspective. And Alison Johnson. Thank you. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this government's long-term failure to properly invest in safe walking and cycling is contributing to this public health crisis? I think this government has put uh, um, uh, record levels of money into uh, active, active travel, doubled the budget on that, um, and uh, uh, you know there will always be um, uh, destinations uh, for money, um, but uh, we keep that under review, uh, and I don't uh, in any way accept the categorisation of this as some kind of long-term failure. Question number two, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government whether the new ScotRail timetable will alleviate delays and cancellations in light of the 73% increase in compensation payments being made by the operator in 2018-19. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. ScotRail's new timetable delivers important benefits from the Scottish Government's continued significant investment in rail network improvements. The introduction of more brand new electric trains alongside more high speed trains means a new total of 625,000 seats each weekday for passengers. Alongside the benefits of faster journey times in, on some routes and higher quality new trains, this is an increase of 115,000 seats per day, a 23% increase since the start of this franchise. And unlike the UK government in England, we have set Network Rail the same tough performance requirement of 92.5% PPM. So both ScotRail and Network Rail must work together to deliver improvements for passengers. Performance is now improving. Yesterday, the first working day of the new timetable saw ScotRail deliver 92.4% PPM, ahead of the GB average of 90.9%. However, I wish to see continued improvement from ScotRail and Network Rail and will continue to press them to ensure improvements are delivered going forward. My grumbles. Well, Cabinet Secretary, that should improve uh, with less compensation being paid, so that must be a good thing. But the consumer watchdog, which has described the ScotRail compensation system as fragmented and confusing, pointing out passengers must produce up to 24 pieces of information to claim. How does the Cabinet Secretary square those facts 
with a statement in a written parliamentary answer to me on the 14th of May that compensation from ScotRail is straightforward to claim. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, it is straightforward in using the app which is provided by ScotRail, which uh, customers can use because it holds certain information for uh, repeat claims uh, going forward. However, where there are lessons where it can be improved, I would expect ScotRail to give consideration to that, in particular the issues which have been highlighted by which. Mike Grumbles. We've had three improvement or remedial plans for ScotRail in three years under two transport secretaries with 249 action points. 20 improvement measures, and now we've got a remedial plan with nine initiatives. If ScotRail's performance last year was the worst in 10 years, with passenger compensation rising to over a million pounds, does the Transport Secretary expect compensation levels to fall dramatically this year because of these plans? And if it doesn't fall, will he see that as a further evidence of unacceptable performance? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, I would prefer passengers not requiring to have to claim compensation, but while they do have to do so, it's important there's a robust and there's a fair process there for them to make such claims. Clearly, if performance improves, uh, then that should reduce the need for compensation claims to be made. But as I've made uh, the point repeatedly in this chamber and also at committee just last week when we discussed uh, this very issue, we need to make sure that all parts of the rail network are playing their part to tackle the issues that cause delays and cancellation of services. For example, the most up-to-date figures which I have now uh, for the course of the last year, taking us up to the 31st of March this year, is that 62% of all uh, delays were as a result of network rail uh, infrastructure challenges. Now, that's not to say uh, that ScotRail haven't got their part to play, but also highlights that Network Rail have got a significant part to play in addressing this issue as well. That's why we need both parts to play their part in making sure that we run the services efficiently to reduce the need for passengers to claim compensation in the first place. And there are four members wish to ask a supplementary on this issue. Richard Lyle to be followed by Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that if Mr Rumbles is so concerned about solving the delays, it is high time that he joined us in calling for the devolution of network rail so that a Scottish Government has the levers to start addressing all the issues impacting performance that he is concerned about? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, it's not for me to, uh, to speak on behalf of uh, Mike Rumbles, uh, but what I can say, thankfully, uh, but what I can say is that it's important that we recognise that both parts of our rail network have an important part to play in delivering passenger services. Um, I think it is only right that ScotRail are held fully accountable for where they fail on their delivery of the right type of services for passengers. Equally, Network Rail need to be held to account for their failure to actually deliver the levels of services which are expected that then have an adverse impact on passenger uh -huh. services. And that's why we need to make sure that we have full accountability of both parts of our rail week here in Scotland. As it stands at the present moment, we have accountability around ScotRail because of the franchising scheme we have in place, but we don't have accountability of Network Rail. And that's why it's important that this Parliament has the powers to be able to exercise that type of decision making to make sure Scotland's railways run for the interests of the people of Scotland in an effective way. Jamie Green to be followed by Colin Smith. Uh, unfortunately for the Cabinet Secretary, the delays at the weekend were caused by driver shortages, nothing to do with Network Rail. Uh, the ScotRail came to the Parliament recently and reassured us that, and I quote, we started to plan for every timetable change at the start of the franchise. We have drivers to cover train services and we have spares. Famous last words, Cabinet Secretary. Do you not think that it's actually poor workforce planning that is much to blame for the delays that we saw over the weekend? And how confident is he that driver shortages are not going to affect more services and more passengers in future? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, um, the member might want to reflect upon the scale of the uh, call offs that took place over the course of the weekend and the reasons for those as well, which I'm sure Scotrail will be happy to give them the details uh, of. But there will always be a case where there will be uh, uh, crew shortages, where crew call off at the last minute, uh, which can then make it difficult for them to be covered. But for example, if you look over the course of the last uh, two days, yes, it can make it difficult for them to be covered in particular routes if there is not the right staff available to actually take on that particular service because they're committed to another service, uh, for example. <laughs> uh, but if you look over the course of the last two days, uh, there will have been, uh, there has been uh, no crew, uh, there's not been no trains cancelled as a result of uh, crew on training at the exact same uh, today. 
As was set out in the remedial plan, which I'm sure the member is familiar with, it sets out in detail the actions that ScotRail are going to take in order to address these very issues. When I was asked about this very issue in committee, the point I made to the committee when we looked at the remedial plan, which Mr Green can reflect back on the official report on, when I raised the issue about why were these issues not taken into account by ScotRail at the time of planning these matters, I was surprised that they hadn't. Yes, do I see it as a failure on the part of ScotRail? Yes, do they need to put it right? That's exactly what the remedial plan is there uh, to do and we expect them to do. What have we saw as a result of the actions that have been taken through the remedial plan? Improvements in service. Yes. And I'm sure even Mr Green would welcome that and recognise that they are taking the actions that will set out in the plan to address these matters. Colin Smith, be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. By September this year, the Cabinet Secretary will have to make a decision on whether he extends the ScotRail franchise beyond 2022. Yet his remedial plan that he talks about doesn't need to be implemented until spring next year after he has made this decision. Isn't the truth that no matter how bad Scotland's rail services are, no matter how appallingly passengers are treated, this government, this Cabinet Secretary is so obsessed by propping up this failing franchise, he has absolutely no intention whatsoever of ending it. Isn't that the truth, Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, in short, no. Uh, but as ever, when it comes to Colin Smith, um, uh, facts often get lost in the course of any discussion in these matters. Let me just be, uh, be clear here is that uh, we've taken out the remedial plan against uh, ScotRail on the basis of of their failure to actually uh, meet certain parts of the contract, which is very robust action. We're now starting to see the benefits which are coming from that. What we won't do is we won't take the approach that the Labour Party want to take, and that is that they want to create a single UK rail network, taking away the existing powers that we have in this parliament over rail in order to centralise it to a UK level so that it fits with network rail over the whole course of the UK. What we want to do is we want to see rail services here in Scotland performing as best as they can. And that's why we're making record levels of investment into rail, providing new rolling stock as well. And that's what we will continue to do to make sure, well, at the same time, calling for this parliament to be responsible for all parts of our rail infrastructure, making sure that it's designed and delivered in a way that reflects the needs and the aspirations of the people of Scotland in investing in our public services, rather than taking powers away from this parliament on our rail network here in Scotland. And briefly, Stuart Stevenson. How many of the new 385 and refurbished HSTs, which were due to be delivered in December last year, are not yet delivered to ScotRail? Cabinet Secretary. So, an officer, as it stands at the present moment, ScotRail have accepted 61 of the 70 ordered Class 385 uh, sets. The number is sufficient to allow ScotRail to deliver uh, significant capacity improvements across the uh, electrified routes in the central belt and it will allow them to also uh, redeploy uh, the diesel trains to increase train lengths in other parts of the network. For HSTs, uh, only four of uh, 26 refurbished units have been uh, accepted from Angel Trains and Wabtec alongside uh, 14 unrefurbished uh, classic trains, uh, which are now operating on the seven cities uh, routes. Uh, I will continue to press Angel Trains and also Wabtec on this particular issue. Met with them last week uh, to press the need for continued progress on this matter, as I've highlighted to this parliament, on many occasions in recent weeks on this issue, but there's absolutely no doubt in my mind, both the delay from Hitachi to deliver the HS, the, the, the 385s, and also uh, to make sure that the refurbished uh, HSTs are delivered on time, has had a significant impact on ScotRail's ability to deliver on the timetable change in December last year. Uh, but we will make sure that we continue to press uh, both Wabtec, Hitachi, and also Angel Trains to address these matters as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, and that concludes topical questions.